Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. The show is a proud media partner for the 11th Annual Media Excellence Awards, which are produced by Access Entertainment in Los Angeles, California. The Media Excellence Awards are recognized as the most influential awards show, honoring innovation and leadership in all things mobile entertainment, lifestyle, and technology. For more information on how to submit to these awards, please visit MediaXAwards.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Jason Troy. He's an executive coach. Jason, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks for having me back on. It's great to speak with you and your fantastic tribe. And yeah, I was, you know, we had such a good conversation last time. And I, in some ways, I almost felt like we cut the conversation short and we were about an hour. So I thought I would have you kind of back on because there was a few other things that I wanted to cover with you that I think are super important that a lot of people don't kind of think about or maybe do it a little bit kind of outdated, but maybe before we get into that stuff, maybe if you want to just give people a quick background on yourself and if they really want to kind of get a, a longer version, they can go to the, the show's website and uh, listen to the pr- past episode. Sure. So the real fast version of it is I went to law school and I got my master's in communications at Syracuse University and I decided not to practice. I went up to Silicon Valley in the late 90s and early 2000s. And, and I got an opportunity to work with Steve Jobs, Very cool. Mark Cuban, the CEO of Netflix, um, Mark Hurd, who was the HP CEO, um, the president of SAP. I mean, Bob, most of the big DC firms like Kleiner Perkins and Benchmark. So I had a great experience. And then, you know, I moved to Dallas and, you know, I decided to try to do my business as a side hustle. And I did that for a while with a partner, then broke off. I wrote a book. Um, I started doing executive executive business coaching for individuals, groups, workshops. And then, you know, last year, um, is the culmination of spending a couple of years really investigating how to build high-performing teams and organizations, did a TED Talk, and now we're here. Very cool, man. No, that's that's great. So we really wanted to kind of focus on a, a few topics today. I think the first one is kind of self-awareness. And what exactly does that kind of mean, and how do people kind of become more self, self-aware? Well, I think self-awareness is really – understanding your thoughts, behaviors, and past patterns in your life. Okay. Because what happens is is that that is how you understand how you interact with yourself to make decisions are affected by outside people. I mean, you know, and and also how you find your own blind spot, right. which are the biggest challenges people have, right? Because sure. the problem, when you talk about people's biggest issues, and I've done this probably now five or 600 times, wow. and they come to me, they will say things like, well, I want to be a better performing manager and leader, but I'm having some challenges. Okay. And the problem with that is is that then they've been trying to figure those out by acquiring new skills. And although they may be doing better, they're still missing something and they know it and they keep hitting their head on a ceiling. Okay. And the problem becomes is that it's not new skills that you have to figure out that are holding people back. It is past patterns in their life 
that they need to identify, eliminate, and then create something new in that place. Interesting. And when you do that, you get exponential gains because those are the things that you can't see. And I tell people all the time, it's the same equivalent of looking at maybe one of your good friends or someone you know really well, and you keep saying to yourself, I can't understand why that person keeps making the same mistake over and over again. And you even tell them what it is, and they can't figure out how to stop it. Okay. And the problem is, when it comes to self-awareness, the stats are 10 to 15% of people are self-aware. But that 95% low, hey? of people... Yes, that low. And I would say to you that highly self-aware people, which are the most successful individuals and fulfilled, right? Okay. Because there are a lot of successful people that are train wrecks or yeah. narcissists or anything else. Yep. But the people that are successful and fulfilled that are highly self-aware are in very low single digits. Interesting. But here's the crux. 95% of people believe they are self-aware, so they don't go out and get any help. And the stats on top of that are only 4% of men are self-aware and 16% of women are. So it, for men, it's even lower, oh, right? Wow. Now we're talking about very low, not even single digits, probably point something of overall men are highly self-aware. So that becomes a lot of problems because you don't understand how you are really affecting other people around you sure. and how you're self-destructing yourself. And an example would be, so I went, and this is probably now eight months ago, to a CEO who brought me in. But again, this could be any level of person and said to me, I know my team can be performing better and they're not. And so when I got talking to the team and I only spent like five minutes asking them a couple of questions, what they said to me across the board was not listening, not hearing, um, doesn't really care about my opinion. Uh, and, you know, when you get several people saying the same thing, it validates whatever the collective group is saying completely. Sure. If you get only a couple people saying that, I would have discounted it. But when almost everyone said it, I thought to myself, that's, a pro you know, that's a challenge. Sure. Well, if you go to someone with that data, right, and this is what most organizations do when it comes to self-awareness, they'll do a 360-degree review, um, they'll do some sort of audit of other people, and then they'll go back and they will confront the person and they will say, hey, we've you know, talked to people and hear what we believe is your biggest blind spot. And if you approach someone like that, because our brains are wired for negativity, right? Our, sure. brain, our brains essentially have not evolved since caveman days. Interesting. Yep. And they're wired for negativity because they're wired for survival to keep us alive. It's the fight or flight part of our brain. Right. So when you give people negative feedback, their first, unless they've been trained and they understand how to internalize it and utilize that information, they will offload it and they will make excuses. So what he would say if I did bring it up initially, oh, my team doesn't get it. They're not committed. They're not really smart. I'm not uh, really sure maybe I even have the right people. He would have given me tons of excuses. And then what would have happened is he would have relented at some point because I can you know, relay the information in a way that I would have cornered him in. Uh, but then he only would have begrudgingly done learning new um, skills on listening, right? Sure. And then in the back of his head, he would have said, I'm going to get all those people who said that I was broken. Because when you tell someone and give them negative information like that, what you are essentially telling them is they are broken. And we don't want to be broken as human beings sure. because if we're broken – Right back in caveman days when you were broken, it meant that you were going to be disconnected from the group and disconnection from the group meant you would die because they would ostracize you and you'd be by yourself and then you'd get eaten, you would die of starvation, whatever it might be. So that is how people's brains works. And what happens is, is that they 
done uh, research on people on the performance reviews and they given them performance review where 90 percent of it was glowing and 10 percent of it was poor mm -hmm. and then they asked people to remember um the performance review and recite it back well what do you think that they remembered the 10 percent that was negative interesting so all right so in a situation like that right so i get all this information and I know that confronting it is not the answer because I know there's something deeper that we have to go back and figure out because when you, I look at people, what happens is, is the blind spot is about pattern recognition. Right. And success in business for people is about understanding their pattern, not only your own, but you can tell other people because people continually do the same behaviors. And so you can anticipate what they are going to do because that is who they are. And they usually don't grow in advance. They just stay in a similar mindset in place. So what I do is go back and start asking questions about what happened during childhood um, to begin with, right? Because that's where most of the problems start. It, it, it's usually either under the age of 10 years old, something happened, okay. or they learned something, or it was some trauma that happened in their life that is causing the situation that's going on. Now, where you may find outliers in this are people who are sociopaths, psychopaths, narcissists, or you to get someone who has some level of a mental illness, right? But sure. if we take those out, because that, that, that's not most people, um, you're going to find something that's going on. So in an instance like this, when I asked a question, I said, so tell me about growing up and your family. And he was in a family with six other people. And I asked, so how did you get mom and dad's attention? Mm -hmm. And he, you know, would get, said something. And I'm like, well, give me an example. And he said, well, I remember one time I was at the kitchen table and I wanted to tell my parents about some school thing I wanted to come to. And so I elbowed my brother and my sister on either side of me really hard. And then I yelled and my parents then heard me and said they would come. Interesting. Right. So what he learned at that moment was that not listening and yelling over other people gets me what I want. Interesting. And sitting back and listen. And then I asked the question. I said, so what if you just tried to not elbow them and then get your parents' attention? And he said, probably wouldn't have worked or it would have been really hard if I would have tried any other way to get any time with them and actually have a conversation, which I thought was interesting. Right? Totally. So that solidified that. And then I asked a few other things that we went into when I brought up listening and doing stuff and it was a similar type thing. So I said to him, it's like, look, your life is full of patterns and that is how you create your thoughts, create thought patterns, which creates your habits, which creates, you know, your actions and your life blueprint. And so what you have to do is understand where your patterns have come from. And some of them are, you know, help you be successful and happy and fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And some are bringing you negative consequences because they're causing problems. And some of them may have been good, but now are not helping you, right? right. And right now, one of the ones that's not is your lack of listening, right? Because sure. it may have served you, but it is no longer. And now the choice is you can either make new decisions to be happy and successful and fulfilled, or you're going to have negative consequences. And essentially, I got him to agree that 10 to 20% of the bottom line is being hurt for his lack of listening. And this is a half billion dollar company. Yeah. So you can imagine that's a lot of money. That's a huge right? amount. Yeah. And huge, right? And I said, people leave, which means you'll have huge costs in hiring people totally. and finding them and replacing them and time. So you have a choice. And then it's at that point, he doesn't feel broken because also what I said to him, I said, look, it's neither good nor bad. You're in this place. You're just here. Sure. Patterns are like ones and zeros, like in computers. It, 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 you didn't know what you didn't know, but now sure. you do. So now you have a choice. Right. Interesting. And right. And at that point, what happens is it's like a boxer putting themselves in the corner. I didn't 
get this information from a third party and relaying it. It's coming from him. Right. So he can't say to me, I'm lying or I'm mis- mischaracter- mischaracterizing the situation or painting in facts. Because I'm literally just repeating what he told me. So there is no resistance. Interesting. Right. And when, right. And when there's no resistance, what happens is then people go and dive in a hundred percent. And then I was like, look, the other part of doing this process, which is great, is that these, what I'm going to give you are one to two degree shifts. And that's what I give everyone. They're not big things. They're very small things that will get you massive gains. And so literally we wrote in a post-it note things to do for the next 30 days. And I said, don't do anything outside of this post-it note okay. because otherwise it becomes too overwhelming. So we wrote down things like talk last in meetings, ask more questions, get to know people outside of work more, right? Interesting. Simple things like that that were not – super difficult and all you have to do is take the post-it note and look before a meeting and saying okay which one of these which one or several of them should i use in this meeting and that's it right it would take like less than 10 seconds and then it's you can implement it in 30 days things completely turned around and people um on his executive team was like i don't even know this person anymore it's like a brand new person they were like whatever you're doing keep doing it with them and it was a simple fix, right? And sure. then he got the evidence pretty quickly because I not only did I tell him that, he saw it and how other people interacted with him. Sure. And then he said to myself, like, he was like, I just couldn't believe that it was something I couldn't see and didn't know and how negatively affected me and the people around. And it was so easy to change, right? So, sure. And, and, the, and what happened, the consequences for this, right, so when you think about this, you're saying, okay, that's great. Well, what about an organization? Well, the problems tend to start that three quarters of people leave because of their manager. Yep. And the problem with their manager is that they'll go to two employees that let's just give an example that two employees come in that have listening issues. Okay. Well, one of them may have had a listening issue because they've had past patterns like this CEO and so when you tell them to improve their listening, they can't because it's not a skill acquisition. It's a past pattern issue. But the other person, it's just a skill, right? So they pick it up and run with it. And then the manager says to themselves, well, that one person gets it and the other person doesn't. Well, that's not really true. The other only reason that person got it is because it's a skill issue and they had to acquire something new Versus the other person, in this instance, it wasn't something they needed to acquire. It was something they needed to eliminate, and then they could, in its place, get improve the skill. Interesting. And so managers do a poor job of this, and so what happens is they eliminate really good employees or great employees because they're misidentifying what the problem really is, right? Thanks for listening to Building the Future. This show is heard by more than a million people monthly in over 15 markets worldwide, including Silicon Valley. Kevin Horick's guests are leading business owners, successful entrepreneurs, and merchandisers worldwide. Now, your brand has an opportunity to tap into this dedicated and active group of business people who are looking for places to invest and the right opportunities to support. Find out how you can get involved at buildingthefutureshow.com. Because I, I think everybody at some level, and clearly the stats are really low, is there anything that like people can do to just start becoming more self, self-aware self um, just in, in their kind of everyday life? Because I think it's obviously like a huge issue in, in the workplace. Yeah, I think one of the first things to start doing is to ask yourself the question, you know, what do I believe are the biggest challenges I have in my work per se, right? Like what are the biggest problems I'm having right now and how would I characterize those challenges? Because here's the first, how you can start to see how self-aware you are is if you write that down and I, I tell people write this down, don't like put it in your head because then 
you can rationalize this. Write it down so you have the evidence. Okay. Then go to people that you trust and care about, not only in your work, but in your personal life who know you extremely well. Because if someone doesn't know you extremely well, they won't be able to give you enough feedback because they don't have enough interactions with you. Interesting. And then ask them questions and then go to them and say, look, I know that in order for me to improve as an individual, as someone in business and take everything to the highest levels, I have to identify my own challenges and actually my own strengths and figure out what those are. So I can, you know, do the things that can improve either one, right? Sure. And the strengths take them to the highest level of mastery and the things that are my blind spots that could really be sabotaging my success, I need to eliminate those or at least minimize them significantly. And you tell people, I can't do this by myself because I know my brain is not wired to allow me to do this. And people will be like, okay, great, right? And they'll help you. They'll help you do that. And so, what you do then is you ask them. The first question is an easy one, right? I would ask someone, so what do you think are things I do extremely well, or what do you think are my greatest strengths as a person? Okay. And you need to probably ask a handful of people. I tell people. You probably need to ask around five or six people because what happens is if a person, if you get five or six answers, you need to look at the the ones that people over and over again to say the same thing. Right. Because sometimes, you know, someone may have a view of you that no one else has, and that could be incorrect. So it's a false indicator. Sure. So then you can ask the next question is you can say to someone, well, what do you think are my biggest challenges? Right. Sure. And then, you know, or hurdles that you see that I have challenges with interacting with you or with other people. And then the last question I'd ask them is saying, if you had one piece of advice that if you don't think that if I don't do this one thing, it's really going to hurt my future success and happiness and fulfillment, what would that one thing be? Interesting. And you'll start to paint a picture and get a really good indicator of what is starting to go on, right? Okay. In your own life. So that's probably one way. The second way is to take a look at whatever behavior you want to change, right? So let's say it's a New Year's resolution. Okay. Um, or actually, I'll even give you a better example is that I had a woman who, this is several years ago, who's a manager in a workshop I did on, on self-awareness and managing other people. Okay. And she said to me, I want to be a better manager. I'm in the top half of the people that I'm managing, and I really want to go significantly higher. And I asked her, okay, um, you know, why do you want to do that? And she's like, you know, I love my job. I love being around people. I want to bring out the best in them, but I can't to get to the next place and I've taken training and done stuff. And I said, okay. Um, and I went through a process with her. I asked her the first question was, you know, well, what stories do you have around your own behavior that's preventing you from becoming a great manager? And I don't remember what she told me, but she told me some stories. Okay. And the stories would, you know, stories could be that, you know, my employees don't believe in me enough, right? The company doesn't support me in my disciplining people. It's whatever, it's whatever external story is about your situation and how other people are interacting with you or creating conditions in which you can't flourish. And the, the next question you ask yourself is what emotions come up when I think about the stories and the behavior I want to change. And in her instance, shame and guilt were brought up, but it could be anything, right? Sure. What negative, and I said, what negative emotions come up right now? Not, you don't want positive ones. You want to focus on what negative emotions come up when I think of these um, stories and behavior I want to change. And hers was shame and guilt. And then the next question after that, and that question on the emotions is once you start to understand the emotions, 
it helps you start to dig deeper into what's really going on because your emotions are the gateway, which opens up all of your answers. They're the early warning signs. It's like, if you get really nervous before doing something, it can just be that it's a huge event, but often it also is a sign that something else is going on internally and you're just blocking it. Interesting. So the next question I ask is to her, is, is a question on limiting beliefs. And I asked her, so what self-limiting beliefs do you have about these emotions and stories and the behavior that is going on? And the self-limiting beliefs are really powerful because, again, a belief is something of absolute certainty about. Sure. So a self-limiting belief is something that you believe limits you and you have certainty about it. And if we have certainty about it, then we don't have any doubt and we buy into it and it gets into scarcity thinking, right? Sure. So, and there are two types of self-limiting beliefs that people have, right? There, one is I am not enough, enough of something, sure. whatever that might be. It could be I'm not smart enough, you know, I don't have enough determination, whatever it might be. You know, I'm not even looking enough to do this. And the other part of it is, is, is who do I think I am? It's more of an imposter self-limiting belief, right? Like, right. who do I think that I am that I could be in the top 1% of all managers, sure. right? So her thought, and she told me, she was like, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy enough. When I asked her the question of the thoughts that came to her head, and I thought that's really interesting. And then I asked her, I was like, so when's the last, when's the first time in your life that you felt not worthy and not good enough? And tell me what pops up in your head. Don't overthink it. Just tell me exactly what you think and go back to the first earliest memory that you have. And she had a memory of in high school, she picked up the phone and her grandmother and mother were on the phone and they said to her, that she, you know, you're, or something about her high-pitched voice, because she's in her mid-30s and has a high-pitched voice as a woman, and they were like, you know, you need to change your voice, because if you don't, you won't be successful in business, you'll never find a husband, and we want you to do better. Wow. And it, this happened kind of, she cited several times that this had happened in high school and in college, right? So one of the things I said is that, like, how does it, when you pick up the phone today, think to yourself, does that story ever pop up again? And she just started to cry. Oh, wow. And so what's been happening, every time she had to pick up the phone and make calls to do anything with people, sure. that tape was playing in her head. Wow. So while she could override it to a point, she couldn't all the time, right? Sure. So brute force works to a certain degree. That's why people, some people can do your New Year's resolutions where they're going to the gym and eating well, and then they keep doing it and never stop. Right. But most people can't. So brute force can work, but it's pretty rare when it does. And you usually only can do it in one instance and not another. No, okay. And so, right. So at that point, I was like, that's the problem. Sure. Every time that phone and when you're communicating with other people, which is probably translating into other electronic means, when you're speaking, is now short-circuiting you, and we have to change this. Sure. And then I said to her, okay, well, what would happen if you thought to yourself that people love my voice? They want to hear it. They want to interact with me. They need it. They get inspired. They get motivated, right? Mm -hmm. I help them. And I was like, so what beliefs then would you have about yourself, right? And sure. then she said to me, like, I'd be powerful. Like, I could do anything, right? I'd feel really smart. I'd feel admired. Um, and there are other things. And I said, okay, well, what, what emotions would you feel? And she was like, I'd feel really happy, fulfilled, excited, anticipate, you know, be, you know, motivated to go to work every day. And then I said, well, what stories about the world around you would you have? And she'd be like, you know, 
I remember she said something like that I would, I could, you know, do anything. I could get all my employees to be successful. The organization would be bought into me. And, and I was like, okay, well, what behavior then would that all create? And she said, well, I'd be a top manager in the business. Interesting. And I said, great. So I, so here's the action I want you to take. And I want you to remember all this is I want you to now with every phone call with a prospect, with your customers, with your team and the company itself, I want you when appropriate, but to take action within the next week or weeks, I want you to share the reason you got in sales was because of that phone call that your mom and grandmother gave you. And I want you to tell exactly what you told everyone here about that Interesting. and share it and be very vulnerable. Right. Sure. And what happened, right? Because here's what happened. I mean, think about it this way. I knew what was going to happen because when we lead with vulnerability, right, when appropriate and when we have boundaries, sure, it inspires other people and allows them to open up because it's saying to them it's safe to share. So then they start sharing vulnerable things with us, which then fast tracks trust, which then fast tracks building a relationship with people. And then you're off to the races. So what happened is, is that she got lightning results. And, you know, within the next quarter, she jumped up in like the top 5% of salespeople and her team's results went through the roof, right? Because she inspired them and then they started sharing things with her. And then she would just talk to even prospects and do some of it, which she normally didn't do that much of. And she would close people super fast because she would just tell them the story and then they would just tell her things. And again, we buy from people we like, not necessarily the best solution, price, or whatever, right? Sure. I mean, that's how we operate. So when you go through that whole process, it's really the anatomy of change. And what it does is it goes through the stories, the emotions, the limiting beliefs. And then the first time you've ever felt that way to go back to the beginning when you had a whiteboard with nothing written on it and what are the first things being written and even if you can't come up with something that maybe not into your 20s or 30s it's at least a starting point and then you can backtrack and it's hard to do this by yourself but you can and you can do it with a friend or you can find a coach it's probably the best thing to do but when you do that, you can find your blind spots. And both of these processes, if you do that, will help bring up enough of the information to solve whatever problem that you are having or that are unaware of. And the problem is, is that the people around you are probably unaware of it, too, because they're not looking for it. So they're just going to say things like, oh, that person doesn't care because you're not listening, but it really has nothing to do with it, right? As right. we went through the example. It's just sure. a learned behavior because of past patterns. So that's got nothing to do with caring. Yeah, interesting. That's fascinating. So, and, and then I guess that kind of evolves into how you kind of interact with people, um, whether they're kind of employees or other kind of partners in the business, right? Yeah, because here's the problem. If you don't know what's going on inside of yourself, Yeah you won't be able to interact with other people and have really frank truth telling conversations. And it's something we talked about before the podcast is that, you know, truth telling is in very short supply. And the problem in business is that truth telling is the shortest way to get to great answers, solutions, interactions, resolve conflicts, everything else in the shortest amount of time without wasting time, cycles, um, all these other problems, because that's usually what ends up happening. And it's because we make up stories to fill in the evidence, right? I mean, that's sure. 90% of people, um, what they do in to create stories is they're conspiracy theorists, right? And an example is, let's say you were in a meeting. Okay. And someone asked you a question and you gave an answer. And the person across the table from you rolled their eyes. Okay. Interesting. And I've asked this years ago to hundreds of people. And I said, so what would you think? And they would say, 
Well, that person across the table didn't like me, didn't like what I said, right? Or there's something about me that irritates them. Were the three most common answers. Okay. And I said to them, I said, you're just like JFK in Oliver Stone movie. <laughs> you realize that the only thing you know is that you said something and the person across the table rolled their eyes. Sure. Those are the only two facts you have. But we fill in the facts with conspiracy thoughts interesting because we don't know the answer because we've never asked the person so we don't honestly know sure. there's no way for you to know based on that right sure that person may have gotten a text message that from their kid who was sick they may sure. have got a text message from a client who was mad they may have had their own boss come in and say something that was really negative you don't know what it is sure but we're our brains are wired for negativity, so they bring in the negative thoughts against ourselves first, rather than taking into consideration the other possibilities. Interesting. So, right, and the other thing that happens, so what happens in a situation like that, let's say that plays out, how you would deal with that and actually do it in a way that would build a stronger relationship with that person and get the answer that you would need to figure that out is to talk to them privately and say to them, look, the story in my head that I'm making up is that you rolled your eyes at me because you don't like me or like what I said. Okay. You know, I just wanted to have a conversation about you because I want to have a great working relationship with you. And if you say the story in my head, I'm making up, you're already telling someone you're making up a story, right. but it's the one that you have, and you are trying to start a conversation. So then that allows them the room to say, no, Kevin, that's not at all. What it was is that, you know, I had, my kid was sick and, you know, my husband couldn't go and pick up. So now I've got to run out of here and I've got all these meetings today and I'm not really sure how to get that done, blah, blah, blah. Sure. And then you're like, oh, and now you know and now you don't have any negative feelings towards that person, which will hurt your working relationship, which hurts you, which right. hurts the other person, and which hurts the organization, right? Sure. And your manager and everyone else in the ecosystem or surround both of you. But if you have it, it doesn't. So that's the problem that starts to go on when you don't have these conversations with people. So one of the things that I tell people to do is to lay down a map of their organization and the people that are on every rung. Okay. And what you want to be able to do is your manager and your colleagues are the right places to start. But then you want to go to your manager's manager and people higher up and start having these conversations with them because then you're going to be able to understand how the organization works. You're going to build strong relationships and you're going to pulse on where your relationship is with that person. And it may be nowhere, but that's fine. But you need to know. So I tell people the first question you need to start asking people is on a scale of one to 10, one being poor, 10 being great. How would you rate our relationship and why? Interesting. And then you have a discussion. It could be brief. It could be longer. And then you say, well, how can I move this closer to a 10? Sure. Right? And so a couple things happen, right? Is that one, you actually get a specific number. So you know categorically for sure where they are rating you and why that they believe that to be the way that it is. Not the way you think it is, but the way they view it, right? Sure. So that's extremely helpful. And then you get them to tell you how you can move it closer to a 10. So you don't have to guess. Interesting. You don't have to say, well, let me go get them donuts or brownies <laughs> or a, sure. a coffee or do this and, and hope it works. They're going to tell you more or less what you need to do. And you would ask that question to your colleagues probably once a quarter because you want to continually improve those relationships and monitor them um, in a way that's helpful. 
you would want to ask your boss that question every month because you'd want to keep a pulse on it. Sure. And the conversation could be too, too, could take a minute. Sure. They might say, uh, it's great denying and just keep doing what you're doing. I don't have anything to really think about. And okay. then that's it. Right? right. But they could say it's a four because I didn't like the way that you said something in the meeting um, that disagreed with me. And then you can have a conversation about it. And people who you report to you, I would have it once a month as well, because then they'll know where they stand with you. And that helps you not become the bad boss. Right. Interesting. No, that's and the second thing. Keep Go going. Ahead. Sorry. No, keep going. And the second thing that I would do, and this would be for people that you report into and people that you manage yourself. Okay. And the question is, how would you rate my work product? And work product meaning, like, how would you rate my sales based on my retention, you know, interaction with clients, whatever it might be, the adjectives around it sure. on a scale of one to 10 and why, right? Okay. Well, what will happen is for you people you manage, you will understand their self-awareness around this issue because if you think it's a four and they think it's a 10, there's a problem. Sure. And then you can ask them questions around things such as, okay, well, what can, how can you improve that and get that closer to 10? What needs to be done? Sure. Right. And that thing is your own manager because then you, it's helpful because it makes you accountable for this. Sure. And then you can bring up a question on, okay, well, what resources do you need or what help do you need from me to achieve that and get it closer to a 10? And then you can have a conversation about that, right? Sure. And see what's possible. And once not. Interesting. But right, but it keeps a lot more truth telling in the process, right? So those things are questions that you can start doing with people immediately on a consistent basis to make a major impact and to make sure everyone knows where everyone else is at on a thirty day basis. And so the other part of it is you're getting a performance review once every month. Right. And you're doing it and you're controlling it, right? The people that are listening to this, it's not, it's in your hands because you are asking the question. Right. And so you hold the power. You don't have to wait for your manager to ask it. You don't have to wait for the feedback. You ask them that question and you'll get the feedback. Interesting. Because they're not going to proactively give you all this feedback because they're tired, they're overwhelmed, they all to do. But if you ask them a question, they're going to give you the answer. Right. So Interesting. Get empowered, right? And you, you have to start asking more questions and digging all the way around on a consistent basis to get at the truth and the heart of the matter. And this is just one instance. Sure. No, that's that's really interesting. And I, I think that's kind of a good transition into um, – I've never really thought it's kind of worked is is when you set goals with kind of your manager and you have a lot of really good insight on kind of why they traditionally don't really work for a lot of people. Do you want to maybe talk about that? Yeah. So here's, here's a great example. So I had some clients that are in, I went to see in a fortune 10 company Okay. and they're both managers in the five percent of all managers globally so these are smart people we're not sure. and they're highly successful okay so i asked them the question i said so how are you coming up with your goals and they told me well you know i'm thinking about what i believe the business unit needs what my group needs and then i shared them with my manager and you know he approved my goals and that's what i have and i said so are you sure that those are the right goals and they both said, yes. And I said, so have you shared these goals with all of your colleagues? And they said, well, some of them. And then I said, well, have you shared these goals with other heads of the business unit and gotten their feedback or your manager's manager's people, right, on their sure. level and got feedback or understand and understand what are their goals? and understand what are their key initiatives, what are their key challenges. And of course, they both said no. 
And I said, so, so I said, are you really sure that your goals are supporting a business unit? And then they stopped and I said, you're relying on your manager doing your work, right? And you know what happens when you make assumptions and you know that your manager actually has done that. And they were like, we don't know for sure. We believe, but we don't know. And I'm like, okay, you're making a lot of assumptions and you're probably wrong. Interesting. So what you have to do is start thinking like a CEO. A CEO thinks from the top down. They don't think from the middle. And that's the problem. You have to, they always say like you should be thinking and operating like one position above. I'd argue it's two or even a better position is to assume that your CEO or the business unit or the company. Interesting. Because then what happens is you're going and asking all these people those questions. Sure. What are your goals? What are your challenges? What are your opportunities? What are your threats? Right. Sure. Like all these other questions and digging into theirs. And it could, you know, if you don't need to do this that often, right? It could be, you know, once a year you ask this and then check in another time of the year and saying, Hey, you know, I wrote down all this stuff. I'm wondering where you are on it. What's going on? Sure. Because then when you're doing your own goals, you're going to better understand. You can say to your manager, well, this is a better goal because as I was talking to Bobby, Sue, and Joe, like they're doing these things in the organization. I think that we can support them in a much better way. Well, you'll be the only one doing that. Your manager will see that. And then they may say, well, how did that come about? And saying, well, I realize that if I don't think like a CEO, I'm thinking in a siloed way and scarcity mindset because I'm only thinking about my own work and our groups, not how we can help support and serve other people and actually make the greatest impact on the organization. Well, your manager and your manager's manager are going to be like, wow, that person is a leader. Because totally. that's how a leader thinks. They don't think about what's in it for them. They think about what's in it for the organization. And that changes everything. And you're going to have better goals. You're going to have better results. You're going to have great relationships, right? Because the other part of it is now you know all these other people. Right. And when a promotion's up, you are now going to have a lot of advocates. Because yeah, they'd rather have you in that position who actually has interacted with them, cares to have done it, taken the time, has shown that they're thinking across the organization is a problem solver. You'd probably help them with something as well. Sure. Because the other part of it is when you ask all these people, you're going to see holes in the organization. You're going to see problems that other people may not be seeing and you can point them out. Well, when you do that, you are seen again as a leader and a great manager, right? Mm -hmm. So because you just have more information and our mind sees patterns and other people won't because they won't be able to see it. So you're going to stand out. Sure. Does it take a little bit more time? Yeah. It doesn't take that much time when you really think about it. I'm not, you know, these are 30 minute meetings. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. It's not, it's, it's not you. You're less concerned about sharing your stuff with them. You're more concerned about getting information from them. Sure, you can share your goals, but they're not going to be as concerned about them because you're probably not going to be directly necessarily affecting them with the things you have to do. But if you say to them, I want to talk to you because as part of this organization, I I want to understand what your opportunities and challenges and goals are. So I can better support you and create better goals for myself that support, you know, my group, my team, the organization, also that I can spot holes and opportunities that I may be able to help and also help you solve as I'm talking to other leaders. And they'll be like, okay, I'll take that meeting. Sure. Right. I mean, who's going to say no to someone who's taking initiative like that? No one. Yeah. Right? Interesting. So, right. So, that's how you do better goal setting. And you don't have to sit there and beat your head and think, do I have the right goals? You'll know if you do or not. Because if you talk to the person who's heading finance, you might say to yourself, if you're in sales, well, how does this affect me? Well, if a problem is collecting from people 
or finance views the retention rate at core, there's an opportunity for you to start finding holes and getting involved and looking at your goals. You may not, but at least you understand what's going on, and you could alert someone else saying, hey, this is on their radar to someone in operations or someone else in sales who's on this. You may want to talk to them to see what the impact is and how you can work better together um, in solving this or at least communicating this because they're viewing this as a problem. Well, now you're seeing as someone who's plugging holes on both sides. Sure. Does that make sense? No, that's that's really great. I, I think that's really good advice for, for people out there. But we're kind of coming to the end of the show. So I know we talked about it a lot in the last episode, but do you maybe want to just give a quick overview of, you know, what you talk about in the podcast, some of your other services and your, uh, your, your team building game. Sure. So, and the book, sorry. Yep. And the book too. So, uh, there's several things that I have. One, I have the coaching services one-on-one with the group. Um, and they help people on self-awareness issues, management, leadership, building out your own skills and your career blueprint. And those can be done, you know, with individuals and groups. I do workshops on management, leadership, um, specialized things like self-awareness. I also have one on building high-performing teams. And along with that, I have a workshop um, that I created and how to build the highest-performing and most innovative team. And it's based off my TEDx talk um, in a game I created, Cards Against Mundanity. And the game is free. Um, You can download it on my website and also at cardsagainstmundanity.com. And it's a fun team-building game. And it was built off research that Google did on how to build the highest-performing teams is built on creating closeness and trust with people. They call it psychological safety. Sure. And it was built up another study where strangers ask each other vulnerable questions. And at the end of 45 minutes, there were originally 54 and they've done it. They've done it dozens of times. 30% of the people created the closest relationship of their lives. Wow. So imagine going up in Starbucks and grabbing four people and at the end of 45 minutes, you having four other best friends. Yeah, that's, that's wild, right? What this game can do for you. Interesting. Super. And I've done it with 5,000 people who played it, and companies like Amazon, Oracle, Microsoft, Google, tons of others have as well. Very cool. So that's there. And then you can get my book, Social Wealth, um, on Amazon. And that's how to build great business relationships. And there's tons of other stuff on my website as well, jasontroy.com. And that's jasontreu.com. Perfect, Jason. Well, again, I really appreciate you taking the time in your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you, and have a good rest of your day. Thanks. Thanks, man. All right. Okay, bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community, sign up for our newsletter, or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.